Well, good afternoon. My name is Ishan, and I'm with my group here, Ethi, Arjun, Isabella, and Dorothy. And we're really excited to share with you our JPC experience that we had this summer in rural India with the women, all women labor union called SEWA. SEWA stands for Self-Employed Women's Association. And in Hindi, ironically, SEWA also means service. So today, we'd like you to walk you through what SEWA actually does. Then we'll walk you through our methodol research methodology. And finally, we'll share with you our pretty <coughs> exciting results. So this summer, we, were, we worked with SEWA to create an impact assessment on their capacity building programs. A capacity building program can be thought of as a small educative session or small, a stream of sessions that focuses on a very specific topic, whether it be embroidery, to agriculture, to IT. So SEWA works and uses these capacity building programs as their primary tool to achieve their one goal. The one goal of SEWA is to organize women in the informal sector of India to help them achieve self-employment and self-reliance. And what was special, what was so special about SEWA's capacity building programs was two things. The breadth of sectors in which it covered from IT, embroidery, agriculture, animal husbandry, seeding, all these things. And the second thing was the self-sustainability of these programs. And what I mean by self-sustainability was that SEWA was able to create a sustainable capacity building program that had a trickle-down effect of skill and information from SEWA administration and people of higher education all the way down to rural communities. And this was extremely interesting to witness. So SEWA administration would create a curriculum or a module of a specific capacity building program and would teach them to their experts called master trainers in the field. Master trainers would then teach women of SEWA classes of 50 or 30 or community. These women would then, um, would then take these skills that they learned and then use them in their communities to attain jobs and higher incomes, which then had a successful impact on their communities. So as Ishan mentioned, our goal, our goal was to basically assess the validity and efficiency of Save Us projects on the ground. And the way that we were able to accomplish our goal as a, as a project was to use rapid appraisal methodology. And this technique, this research technique was taught to us by our faculty advisor months before we actually hit the ground and running. What rapid appraisal is, is basically a triangulation method. As you can see here, it takes into account secondary research, key informant interviews, and focus groups. And we use this triangulation method to really make sure that we were cross-examining and cross-validating -val our data. Two additional reasons we used rapid appraisal was such. Number one, we used it because it allowed us a lot of flexibility as far as topics go. It really allowed us to encompass a wider variety of topics and factors in making sure that our data was precise and accurate. And number two, rapid appraisal also helped us really gain sensitivity as far as gender issues and budget constraints go. What I mean by this is it really helped us make the females, the women that we were interviewing and researching more comfortable and more aware of what we were asking them. And finally, again, like I mentioned, since it allowed us to encompass so many different variables in such little time, it helped us with our budget and time constraints. So as I mentioned, the first leg of this triangulation method was secondary research. This was really step one in making us feel, making us aware of what we were researching. It really helped us get our feet wet in what we wanted to achieve as far as our research project went. Uh, following the microfinance debacle in the South Asian subcontinent, we were really looking forward to something new. We were looking forward to something new in terms of economic development. And we found just the thing with capacity building pro programs and vocational training projects. As you can see here, it really struck us that over the half, over half of the Indian economy is actually based on the informal sector. This really piqued our curiosity and our interest, and as such, we were able to really birth a new research project in terms of capacity building. So the second leg of our research comprised of key informant interviews. We interviewed SAVE administration, SAVE staff to find out what the, uh, the underlying goals and the underlying assumptions of SEVA. And we then tried to uh, align those goals with their programs. We also interviewed them to talk about their, their basic operations. 
We also spoke with, Matt, with um, university professors. These university professors developed the modules, the education modules that Ishan spoke of earlier, to, that created the trickle-down effect of, of education and knowledge and skills. We also spoke with um, master trainers who were trained by those university professors to, to find out what, their, what the effect of SEVA was on their lives. And we also spoke with um, relatives of SEVA members to reinforce uh, the, the positive or, what, or just the, the impacts of SEVA upon their family's life. And we also, the most exciting part of our research was conducting the focus groups. These focus groups were comprised of approximately five women uh, because um, as, our, as our faculty advisor uh, told us was that research has shown that focus groups of more than five women are become ineffective and less than that um, also tend to be less effective than focus groups of five people. Um, these were, we segregated these focus groups based on length of involvement with SEVA. So shorter term, this, we did this so that we could compare the effects and try to remove um, outside variables from our data. Um, these variables, as Isabella will speak, with, speak about in a, in a bit, were included the macro development of the Indian economy. After we, after we conducted these focus groups, we conducted follow-up interviews with the most engage, engaged members of those focus groups. We were able to get detailed reports, a detailed history of their involvement with SEVA, and detailed history of their lives in general to see how, they, how SEVA had affected their lives. Um, this allowed us to get a better picture and a, a much clearer picture of the effect of SEVA upon members' lives. So in total, we spoke with, a, we spoke with 73 members of SEWA. And overall, we aggregated the number of times a particular topic or a particular benefit of SEWA was brought up. As you can see in the chart, there were definite social, and econo social economic and social demographic um, benefits of involvement with SEWA. And we saw that there was a continued desire to, um, to continue staying with SEWA, um, but that also meant that there was almost a slight disconnect between what the program's goals were and what the actual members' intents were in terms of the women were having such a great time <laughs> and benefiting so much from SEWA that they didn't actually want to go start um, their own microenterprises. In terms of socioeconomically, we found that the women were able to better sell the products, such as the embroidered handcraft um, um, woven products that they were making to um, a wider base of customers through SEWA. Selling more of these products also meant that they were able to purchase more fixed assets for their households. And SEWA also provided them with more loans, um, with greater access to loans that they wouldn't have been able to get through traditional bank loans. Um, so these women would form these support groups and these savings groups in which they would act as each other's collateral um, in order to um, it, achieving like a very low default rate. Now, my favorite part about hearing about the stories of the Save a Woman were, was to be able to actually see the social impact that Sewa had on them. So especially with the groups with longer term involvement, we saw that they were really energetic, really engaging, and so enthusiastic about sharing their experiences with us. I mean, they were even inviting um, Arjun and Ishan to go meet their daughters and <laughs> invite them back to the house. So they were just, they were just um, so welcoming, um, especially in comparison to the, to the women who had just joined um, Sewa, who were a lot more timid and shy. So that was one of the biggest noticeable differences that we saw. In addition, um, the women were also less confined to their um, households. So before, they would be really um, dependent on their, house, on their husbands because they didn't have an income. They wouldn't really have a purpose or a reason to, um, to leave their house. But with Sewa, they were able to go into bigger cities, um, fly on planes for the first time, um, and just really leave the, the domestic confinements that they were um, previously subjugated to. Um, they also, this also led to a greater voice and vote within the whole entire community, not just in their household. And another, something else that we noticed was that within the SEWA programs, there was a great almost equalizer with the programs so that um, within the administration and within the programs, there wasn't really um, a lot of the social um, caste or 
gender or, um, or religious barriers that you might find um, in broader India. India. Lastly, they were also um, able to better provide access to more better educational opportunities for their children and for their cousins and other relatives. So uh, we acknowledge that there are some limitations to our study. We have uh, some variables. The first one are companion variables. We were unable to isolate uh, the effects of the growing Indian economy on these women's economic benefits. So it might be a combination of the capacity building programs and of the economy. We were not able to isolate that. The second um, bias might be selection. Since our project was organized abroad, we were not able to arrange the field visits. It was all arranged by SEVA, so we might have seen the best of SEVA and not what is true across the board. Um, finally, SEVA was, pre was pre present at all our interviews, given our language barrier. This might have hindered the women from um, speaking out their minds, uh, especially in terms of criticism towards SEVA's programs. So we just want to be aware of that. Um, Finally, given our research, we were able to give some feedback back to SEVA just to make sure that there's that disconnect between um, their mission and the members' goals in terms of microenterprise, like Dorothy mentioned earlier. Um, we also wanted to them to be aware that there is some that our research and our um, feedback might be biased as well. Finally, we made a mutually beneficial relationship with SEVA. It was really great um, because we were able to give them a process documentation of the capacity building programs. Um, and this is a resource for them to use with international donors, English speaking donors. Um, so it is a great resource for them. In terms of us, it was great to be able to learn from such a well-managed program, yield an excellent results in terms of service learning. Um, it was very great to be able to learn from this trade union as well as from the women. Um, this was a great experience, and we really just want to thank JPC for giving us this experience, Deva, and our faculty advisor, Ms. Bumberg, for our help. So thank you very much. If we can open up, oh, we can't open up the floor for questions. <laughs> yeah.